Hello, humans. Welcome to the M Work Podcast brought to you by Martin. That's me and Carl. That's him. Carl, welcome. Thank you. First co host together. Nice to, nice to be here with you. Thank you for the invite. Pleasure. We're joined by Dawid. Dawid Connoteur Hulu. Dawid. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Richard. Yeah, Richard. Thanks for joining us, guys. Uh, perhaps just to set the scene for our listeners, just to get a bit of background, perhaps start with yourself. Uh, Dawid, a bit of video background, just to give the listeners their context. Yeah, I'm a British Ghanaian entrepreneur. I live in London. I grew up in Ghana, in West Africa. I've got an English mother, a white English mother, and a Ghanaian, a black Ghanaian father. So I know what it is to be both white and black. And uh, yeah, I grew up in Accra until I was 16. And there was a big revolution, and then we we left and came to the UK. I've been there ever since. I qualified as a lawyer. Then I worked as an investment banker for about 16 years, and then I left and set up a couple of businesses. And that, so I'm an entrepreneur now, I guess would be the best way to kind of think of, think of this way I think of myself. And I, I sit on a, on a bunch of not-for-profits as well as a couple of commercial boards as well. So yeah, I have a lot on my plate. And that coming to, coming to the country at 16, how was that lifestyle change for you? How was that? Huge. That was, yeah, culturally the massive change, you know, in Ghana, the sun sets every day at exactly six o'clock, maybe five past all year round. Whereas I came here and I mean, I'd been coming here sometimes during the summer and it always got dark at 10. So I thought, I thought it was a little England, it always gets dark at 10 o'clock at night. But then when we first kind of, you know, stayed longer than the summer, I suddenly realized, ah, oh, <laughs> there's no free lunch here. It gets dark at three in the afternoon during some months of the year, freezing cold. I'd never been below 25 degrees. Now suddenly it was here zero, maybe even minus five degrees. And then I was the only black kid in my school. So a school of 1400 kids. So that was quite a huge kind of, shock age 16 so yeah big culture shock and yeah i had to kind of get into the way of living in the uk and getting to find myself and get comfortable with who i was and in my skin yeah and richard yourself so originally uh, obviously from the uk but li been living in the isle of man for the last four years i was in the britain service in the uk for 18 years and now i do youth intervention on the isle of man and when you say prison service we assume on the right side of those bars Yes, yes. I was, yeah, I was, started my career as a, a support grade, then I moved on to officer, and then I worked in three different jails from Cat Beats, Romans, to ended up in a lifers unit mm. in Swellside. That's obviously where I met David. Yeah, so maybe expand a little bit on that, that meeting and how you've got sort of come together and uh, knowing each other. And Yeah, I got invited in by... Lord Michael Hastings, who is a crossbench peer, who's done a lot of work in prisons and particularly in Swellside. And he, just, he takes people in there to kind of inspire the men and talk about their lives. And he just said to me, do you want to come and talk to, talk to some men? So I, can I pause that for him to see, to know you, where, where's that connection with you publicly speaking around this, these stories at that time? Where was? No, where did where did Lord Hastings find me from? I don't know where he, I'm trying to remember, we bumped into some, into each other at a few events i knew of him he knew of me and yeah he just whatsapp me and just said do you want to come along and you know i do you've been gaining a reputation for the work and speaking you were doing it's less about it wasn't so much about the speaking though it was more i think in financial services i, okay. I do a lot in pensions and in insurance in, in that space i sort of co-founded a couple of companies and so we do quite a lot in the financial services space i think he knew me more for that than he did for the public the, the public speaking work which i really we can get into it but i set that up or created that it's called spellbound for some of the younger folk in in the firm that i'd set up i was very concerned that people generally were coming into the firm they were young but they didn't have the confidence to stand up and present you know when you join as an analyst you're 21, 22, you've got to suddenly start presenting in front of managing directors and it's, and it's hard to do. And I found that people got very nervous. So I set this thing up. And so it was kind of almost a side of destiny. But then I went into Swellside Prison and we got talking and I met Richard and Richard's, you know, the men love Richard in there. He's got a real heart for the men. And yeah, we met, didn't we? I mean, you, you can pick up the story and just kind of maybe. Yeah, so I, I used to run events. Lord Hastings used to come in every two months. Previous to that, I had a lady called Aquia. She brought in so many different eyes, from music eyes to athletes. And then obviously, it started off as a group of 30, and we ended up with 100 men all in the chapel, one officer facilitating it. 
I mean, these men are serving from 20 to 30 years, so they're doing a long time in prison. It's like, how do you give them hope? What do you actually do to like motivate them to make change? And the big, sh it ran for about four years, and Dow would come in 217. And then he said, Oh, my daughter's like just into writing. Would you, she can come and do an article? And she wrote for Azir, was it? Well, did she, well, she was working, yeah, she was working at the time. I don't remember who she was who she was working for, but she yeah she she wrote I think she might even have still been at university, but yeah. uh, she was writing articles and she was very concerned about the plight of people in prison. You yeah. know, you're doing very long long times in, in in jail and you're locked up for 23 hours out of 24. It's it's a very very tough place to be, and so I knew she her heart was there. So you know, I brought her along on one yeah, occasion. So because we just set up a brand new mediation program. Because at the time, so our side was going through a lot of violence. We were having air ambulances. So the men solved, solved the difference by stabbing each other instead of talking. So Dawid was like, oh, do you know what? I've invented this spellbound. And it helps the men engage in conversation and tell their story. And so I was like, okay, would you come in? And they would be like, yeah. I said, I haven't got a budget, so I can't pay you. And he was like, it's not about the money. So everyone that comes in 12 side for me, come at zero cost. Everyone gave the time up and it was all about how can we give these men hope, show them that there is hope on the outside that we can help you achieve. So then Dad would set it up, it took us a couple of months to get in, security checks obviously, all that because it was high security prison. Come in, three sessions. So Dad would do three sessions. The group we had was 15 men. Um, I'll let you tell the story about young Melvin. So. It just changed their lives. It showed them when they went to parole hearings that they could present themselves better when they were having adjudication for something they'd done wrong. They could actually articulate and say, actually, this is the reason behind it. Where before it is, the anger would come out because when you're talking to like business people or people managers, we all get flustered. We're all like, oh, the manager. But when you put your head down, you talk quietly. That would show them actually you can have a voice. The eye contact was important. It's so about how you own the room. They started owning the room and they've started standing up for themselves. So, yeah, yeah I think Spellbound, the vision behind for Spellbound was that you would give people the platform and the ability and the skill to stand up and speak in public, which most people never really learn to do. You know, there's a, a, a book called Death Came Third and, and written by, by a, a friend of mine. And, in, in it, it talks about the survey that was done in the US where people got asked what they were most afraid of and they asked a thousand people and they ranked these fears and death came third. People were third highest fear was dying. Number one was speaking in public. So people would rather die than speak mm -hmm. in public. And it's true, people are just terrified of standing up and, and speaking in front of people. But if you can give people that, that, that power, and it is a superpower to be able to stand up and just confidently address a room. If you can do that, it's an incredible gift. And I think what I find is that people from challenging and difficult backgrounds just don't get taught that. So if you go to, you know, if you're from you know, a, a well-to-do background and you probably went to a school where it was standard stuff and you were just encouraged to speak and stand up and speak at assembly or do ch prayers in chapel or whatever, everybody gets that kind of, you know, or, or be in the school play. If you went to a more difficult school, you just never had that chance and you never learned it. And there are a lot of people like that. So I've always been interested in what happens when you give people like that the ability and the power to speak, because some of them have extraordinary stories. And in, a lot of people in prison have never had a chance to tell their story and to say, this is me, and maybe reflect on it. This is what I did wrong. This is what I would do if I had my time again. And so it's extremely powerful. And I mean, it's always powerful wherever I do it, whether I do it in the school or I do it in the university, but in prisons in particular, it's incredibly powerful. And I remember young guy called Melvin, who was one of the group of 15 that we were working with. And on one occasion, I think this was the occasion when we were getting together to tell your story, because it's a, it's a three session program. The first time you learn a bunch of, they're basically movie quotes that I've strung together to make it sound like a speech. The second one is a big Obama speech, much more complicated and demanding. So we, we, we test delivery, the way you speak, the way you own the room, but also memory, memorizing it. But then on the third session, we do tell your story, which is where you stand up and you say, this is me, this is who I am. And so we were all working up to this until I arrive on the third session and 
there's supposed to be 15 guys, but there are only 14 and one of them's not there. So Richard says, oh, by the way, Melvin won't be there on this on, on today. He can't be there. And I said, oh, why not? And Richard said, well, it's his birthday. So I said, oh, okay, well, what's that got to do with it? He said, well, on his birthday, you get a special visit. They kind of take the, the heat off you a little bit and your mum can come, your cousins can come and they bring a cake and it, it's just a bit easier. So he's got a special prison birthday visit today. So I'm like, okay, fine. So we're about to start with the 14 and then suddenly the door opens and Melvin comes flying through the door, a bit breathless, but he's joining. And so I grab Melvin and I say, Melvin, I wasn't expecting you. He goes, yeah, yeah, I wasn't going to come, but but yeah, I'm going to, I'm here. So I said, but I thought it was your birthday. And he said, yeah, it's my birthday. And I said, but what about the cake and your mom and the cousins? And he said, oh, I've canceled it. I've told them, I've told them to come next year. So I said, but, but, but why? And he said, because today's the day I tell my story and nothing's going to get in the way of that. And he did. And he told this incredible story about how his mom, who was a religious woman, had been praying for him her whole life and he'd come off the rails and he'd got involved in some bad stuff. And now here he was and he'd now found religion and he found God and he just he turned his life around. And he was in tears and we were all in tears and memory of tears. I mean, it was very emotional seeing all these guys doing 20 to 30 years for bad stuff. I mean, these are, these are serious characters and they're all very emotional. So then we end up singing happy birthday to Melvin. And when we get to happy birthday to Melvin and kind of making a huge amount of noise, kind of suddenly the guards come in, they think there's like, it's all kicking off. And they're like, no, no, we're just singing happy birthday to Melvin. So this idea that everyone has a story and your chance to tell the story is it's, it's maybe it comes once in a lifetime, your ability to say, this is me, this is who I care about, what I care about, this is who I am. It's a huge, huge thing. This is the mountain I'm climbing. When did you learn that that was, would open that door? I think I've seen it on and off over the years. I first ran Spellbound, I think in 2012 with some of the young people in my, in my, in my firm. And these are some of the young, the, the, the youngsters who are the guys I created it for. And it always, you can see that people come and the more vulnerable they are and the more they tell their story, the, the more powerful it is. But I think, if I'm really honest, I think more in prison than anywhere else. I mean, we've heard some astonishing stories in prison. I think about some of the stories we've we've heard about. Really, if you think about it, if you're doing 20 to 25 years, 30 years in prison, something has gone very, very badly wrong in your life. And now you have a lot of time to think about that and to reflect on it and think about what you would have done differently. You know, sometimes it's just one thing that you did and now your entire life mm. is destroyed. Well, you have a lot of time now to think about that and reflect. And so in prison, I think listening to the men talk about what they would have done differently, I think for me was a big eye-opener. Sorry to interrupt. It's not just about them opening up. In prison, if you open up, you become vulnerable as well. But they all felt comfortable to share their story. And nobody saw it as weakness. Where in a high security jail, usually if you share a bit of weakness, you're open to a lot of other stuff. So a lot of people will bottle up how they actually feel. So that was powerful in his system itself. Like when we set the mediation program up with a great friend of mine, Gwenton Solly, he came in and like trained the men how to sort the difference out, like put the knives down, sort the difference out, how to mediate and reduce violence as well. But that also puts you in a vulnerability as well because the amount of Stuff that goes in prison. Like, if you don't stand up for yourself, you then become the victim. Because people will then say, right, he's not going to stand up for him. I can take take stuff off him. So you have to then think, well, how do, do we negotiate this? How do we navigate it? How can we get them to be a community? On the mediation program lab, most of the people on the streets of London were not allowed to mix together. We brought them together. So they were all from different gangs, but we brought them together. So they worked well. It's just, and you also had people with a, with a Muslim faith yeah. and a Christian faith, all kind of in the in the. In the, the reality is, this a desire to tell your story is huge because it's really it's who I am, and most people never really get a chance to do that. And I often bump into people who say, "Well, I don't have a story," but actually, everyone has a story. It's whether or not you choose to you choose to you choose to tell it. And I presume that correlation with those talking prisons here in, in, in workspace, you've seen that similar cor correlation where you. Empowered people to speak, tell their vulner tell their stories, tell their, tell their vulnerabilities. How do you navigate? Because inevitably, there might be the odd person then uses those vulnerabilities against them, or do you just not find that once you've once you've had that environment, you've quote have been in that safe space with everyone else and they've been vulnerable to do this? I've just never seen it. I mean, I must have done it now with I mean several hundred people, maybe up six, seven hundred, eight hundred people, and every time 
what happens is there's a magic that happens. So you all arrive and you may or may not know each other. You certainly might know each other in a, in a work setting. Or like we had today, a lot of you didn't know each other. I mean, you genuinely, the only thing you had in common was that you're from the Isle of Man. I mean, apart from that, you came from you know, right, 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 up, right across the island. But what happens is there's a bonding that starts to happen as you start to share your experiences and as you help each other when you when when one person can't quite remember the words and someone then chimes in and says this is this is what the word is that you're missing because that's a hugely powerful thing because when you're standing up there and you forget you feel extremely exposed you feel vulnerable you feel weakened in some way you feel like you're letting yourself down the voice in your ear is screaming and i told you you couldn't do it you shouldn't be standing up here and then people stretch out a hand to you that's extremely powerful and it's very bonding and by the end of it there's this very intense sense that we're a family and that there's this kind of mutual mutual support so people don't tend to use things against each other they tend to it actually just bonds you and you end up with this almost like family yeah. kind of you know uh, bond support group really is it it's like a support group when you did it for me in secure you did and uh, they yeah. opened up about the well, what happened to her? Yeah, she's never spoke to, to anyone about it, but she felt comfortable that she's sharing a room full of strangers. Yeah, it was extraordinary, and she actually said, "This is more cathartic, the most cathartic thing that I've done in the last thirty years." Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what, what do you think it is that that helps people sort of lower their guard? What is it? What is it? About? What do you do that? Yes, that's a very good question because I think a lot of people walk in and they're determined that they're not going to tell their story. They're like, I'm gonna, uh, I'll sit here and I'll learn some of the techniques, but I'm not actually going to share my story. And then what happens very interestingly is that as they watch other people do it, two things happen. First of all, they realize that everybody's in the same position as me. Everybody else is a little bit scared. Everybody else is a bit anxious, but they're doing it. Mm. So then the voice in the air says, well, if they can do it, then maybe you can. And then I think something happens where they just want to share it. Do you remember there was one, there was one, one, one guy who just wasn't prepared to share. Do you remember? And he was standing back and then eventually he said, can I share my story? Do you remember? The policeman? No, 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 no. I'm talking about at Swellside. Oh, yeah. Yeah, at Swellside. There's one guy who didn't, and he, and he told and he told the most harrowing story of, of, about what had happened when he was about 15 or 16 and he'd been pulled into a gang to do something. But he wasn't going to tell his story. But as, right. but, as every, but as everybody, yeah, but as everybody, yeah, we're not going to say, but, yeah, we're not going to say his name, but we'll, and if we do, we can... Um, cut that out, but um, he wanted to tell his story, and he did. And and I think that's what happens is you see other people, and you're like, I'm going to do that. Yeah. If you if you had any any advice for someone who was maybe a bit less confident and was thinking about you know heading in that direction, what would that be? Of telling their story and how to do it. Yeah. I think baby steps. So I think what you don't want to do is have a disaster where you stand up in front of too many people, you get overwhelmed, and then there's a reinforcement of, I knew I should never have done it in the first place. But I think little baby steps, and I think maybe try and have a conversation in front of a small group of people. Get a few friends together, just three or four who are in the same place, and then just prepare a little talk, mm -hmm. and then just give a talk to just three friends, and then get them to do it back. And you'll be amazed. Just that process gets you set up to realize that, you can talk and nothing bad's going to happen. Because we all have this fear that if I get up and and talk, it's going to go terribly wrong. I'm going to end up I'll, I'll end up embarrassing myself in some way. They're all going to laugh at me. I'm going to burst into tears. That anxiety just overwhelms us. But as you can prove to yourself, that didn't happen, actually. And actually, I have got something to say. Like you saw what happened today with all those stories, so immensely powerful. At the end of it, we all took something away from everybody's story. Mm -hmm. What, what was the turning point for your com confidence? Because I know you were, were were originally quite fearful of public speaking as well. Yeah, I I was I was fearful of public speaking when I was a lot younger, and I forced myself to just do it basically. And it's a fear that ought, that never really goes in some way. I think the more I do it, the more comfortable I get with it. But still, I still get anxious, and I still I think people will look at look at people who can speak in public and think, well, it's easy for them to say because they never get anxious. I think everybody gets anxious. I think the greatest public speakers stand up and there's some butterflies. But there's also an excitement. I remember, I'll share this with you. I remember I was asked to give a talk to a group of men, this maybe three or four years ago, on a Saturday morning. And it was kind of a leadership thing. And I was just asked to come and tell my story. 
And the closer it got to the day, the more anxious I was about it. I just thought, I don't really think I've got this right. And I just, what have I got to say? And all that kind of Im that imposter syndrome stuff was coming out. But I was doing a joint presentation with another guy. And when I got there, a guy called Michael, when I got to this thing, with about 10 minutes to go, I was really quite anxious. I could feel the, that familiar surge of adrenaline and butterflies and the whole thing was kicking off. And I was thinking, oh, I'm not even sure I can do this. I mean, it was, it was quite recently. It wasn't that long ago, like maybe, like I say, three, four years ago. Yeah. yeah and and, I, and it happens sometimes. It's like everything. You know, you, sometimes you just get a little bit of stage fright. So, and I remember saying to Michael, how are you, how are you feeling about your talk? Because he was going before me, and then I was going to follow on. And he said, and I always remember this, he said, I can't wait. I can't wait. I just can't wait. How long have we got? Eight minutes. I can't wait. And I said, really? He goes, yeah, I've got some good stuff to bring. I've got some good stuff to bring. This is just going to be great. I can't wait to share this with the men. And then I thought to myself, I've got good stuff to share with these guys. And I just switched the narrative to his narrative, which is I can't wait. And so by the time he, he was done, I was like, yeah, I can't wait. And then boom, and the whole, and then, you know, of course you come with more energy and more passion and the room can tell that you've got something to share. So you share what you want to share with them and you've worked on it and it's fine. It's all around this the good wolf, bad wolf, which maybe I'll just take 30 seconds to explain the good wolf, bad wolf story. So there's a Native American and he's fishing with his grandson and they're chatting and the sun's going down and the grandfather can tell that the grandson is kind of out of sorts and just not very happy with, with stuff. And he takes some to his time, but he says to the grandson, is everything okay? And slowly the grandson opens up and essentially says, life's not okay. I'm really struggling. I'm struggling at school. I don't have any friends. I don't think I'll ever have any friends. I don't, feel like, I don't feel like I'm very smart. I don't understand everything the teacher says. And generally, life is a struggle. And I'm not sure that I can, I, I don't want to go back to school. Just generally, he's just generally miserable and upset. And the grandfather says, well, you know, it's like that all through life. Because in life, there's a good wolf and a bad wolf. And the bad wolf tells you, you're never going to be any good. You're never going to amount to anything you're not able, you can't get up and talk. You can't, you've got nothing to say. No one's interested. You're not very smart. You're not very good looking. Everything, the whole works, right? There's the good, the bad wolf is just giving you this heat the whole time in your, in your ear. But then in your other ear, there's a good wolf who's telling you, you can do this. You've done this before. You've done the prep. You've done the work. When you stand up, they'll want to listen to you. You are smart enough. You got into the school. You know that you're, you know that you're capable. And so you've got this good wolf, bad wolf going on the whole time. And the grandfather tells this to the grandson that all through life, you've got the good wolf and you've got the bad wolf. And this is just something that you've got to learn to deal with. And the grandson kind of listens. And then he says to his grandfather, so if it's a battle, grandfather, between the good wolf and the bad wolf, which wolf wins? Which wolf wins? And the grandfather says, the one you feed. the one you feed. And I've really found that, right? And so with the story I just told you with Michael, I stopped feeding the bad wolf and I suddenly started feeding the good wolf. And I think for all of us, it's the same thing, right? It's, it's, it's this battle and you've got to feed the good wolf. You just shut down the bad wolf, stick the bad wolf visually in like a sack and then stuck, stick it in a river or in a drawer and lock the drawer. And you're right, like, good wolf, tell me. Let, me, let me, let me hear it, right? And I think that battle, you see that when people are telling their story, you know, when you got up to tell your story, I'm sure there's a bad wolf saying, I don't, you know, are you really going to tell this story? And then the good wolf is like, you can do this. And then you do it, right? Or Sam, who was there. You know, when I said to him, Sam, have you got something, something for us? You could just see in his face the anguish as he was just like, ah, th this was a real battle in his head. Good wolf, bad wolf time. Bad wolf was like, what are you doing? You're really going to do this? And the good wolf was like, you can do it. And the good wolf wins and he feeds that wolf and then he does and he blew us all away. Yeah. 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 How do you manage that wolf day to day? I think it's practice, right? It's like everything. The more you, you the more you fall down and you get up, you fall down, you get up, you fall down, you get up. And it's the same with the good wolf. You just keep feeding the good wolf. And every now and again, the bad wolf wins, of course, because that's his life. You know, life is not easy. But the more you realize that the more you feed the good wolf, the more actually good things happen and you are able to do things. I think there's another line that I love, which is, and I, I use this a lot, which is, we live in the stories we tell ourselves. So whatever the story is you're telling yourself about yourself and about the world, that's the story that you that you live in. You tell yourself a bad story and a negative story and one that's just full of misery and woe and one in which you're the victim and one in which this life is completely shot to hell. Well, that's the life you can, that's what you're going to, that's funny enough, that's the world you're going to live in. Tell you also believe you are, you are your own story then, so you're in control of that. 
Well, yeah, I mean, to a large degree, obviously. I mean, you know, I, I got diagnosed with cancer in 2019. Prostate cancer is a pretty huge thing that knocked me sideways. That's not, I didn't write that script, but you then got to deal with that. The doctor tells you, I'm sorry, you've got prostate cancer and you've got it, you've got full blown prostate cancer. When that happens, at that point, you, the, the walls are all okay, everywhere. <laughs> kicking off in a big way. Oh. Every, everything's getting chewed off, right? Bad Wolf is telling you it's all over. You're probably, you know, you're not going to make it. You're going to make it through a year. The Good Wolf is saying, you can do this. You know, you've got, you, know, you, 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 you can do this thing. So, yeah, it's practice and it's discipline and it's forcing yourself to, to not listen to the bad And also recognize when that's what's happening. And then they, that's, ah, I know what's happening here, Mr. Bad Wolf. I know, I know what you're up to. Boom. And then Good Wolf, you kind of listen to. Yeah, I think that's the thing, isn't it? A lot of people don't don't actually realise there is two wolves there, and we can choose to feed the other one, isn't it? And and like in in the high security prisons, going back to that, do you think a lot of those individuals have just literally been feeding the wrong wolf? Choices they've made as well. So, but they probably from a young age been told they're no good, they're not very good at school, they can. No interest in school. So teachers always said you're going to amount to nothing. Probation has probably said to him, "Oh, do you know what? You're just no good. You're a bad egg." Then they obviously the police. Oh, you're always a troublemaker. So it's the people around you as well. There's a good like when you did a podcast with Carl, uh, and he said, "Well, he was in and out of prison all the time." And he said, "Then what he realised is the people in his phone had the biggest impact on his life." So when he was phoning up for advice, he was phoning up drug dealers, burglars. So he changed his whole phone context, he was saying, and he put business people in there. So when he wanted advice, he was ringing people, Downward, Lord Hastings, Kenny, Gwendolyn, people like that to say, what should I do? So it's the people that feed you as well, or feed your wolves. So you can do a lot yourself, but you also need someone to say, you can do it. You're better than this. And like, I'll give you a prime example. In the prison service, you've got different levels. You've got IEPs. So you've got the basic level. You've got the standard level. You're enhanced. And to get up enhanced, you have to be squeaky clean. You have to do everything. But every now and then, you might get knocked down because you, you make make a mistake. You get caught with a phone. You get into an argument or you're late locking up and they get dropped. So you always have to say to them, listen, look how far you have come. And Melvin was a prime example. Melvin lived on the basic regime for five months. He had no interest in he was just doing his own thing. And I remember I went up to him, I said, look, what can I do to help you to get off this basic regime? He said, give me a chance. I said, all right then. So I went to my manager of the unit and I said, listen, I want to give Melvin a chance. I'm going to take him off the basic no, five months. I'm going to take him off the basic regime. I'm going to give him a chance. He stayed six months on the normal thing and got up to his enhanced. Then he made one mistake and he was like, that's it, I've lost it all. And he was in his cell and he was throwing things about. And I said, what are you doing? He said, oh, I've made this mistake and you're going to drop me. I said, no, I'm not. I said, it's one mistake. I said, look how far you've come in six months. Don't go back to that old person like, I'm no good. So the wolf, yeah, but you have to have people around you. If you haven't got anyone around you, telling you positive things. And I love how you used to do that a lot, which is why the men really respected Richard, mm. because Richard would come in and take the long view and not necessarily say, here's a guy who's made one mistake, you're back down to basic, you take a, take a chance on you, and the men knew that. And so interestingly, the men would then respect that, and they would well, then, abuse it. yeah, they wouldn't abuse it, right? So this cycle, you have this virtual cycle that gets set, set up, so of course they make mistakes. But then you would see that, right? So when you left, I mean, I remember just the outpouring of just the men were, yeah, what are we going to do without you? Please don't leave, Richard, don't leave. And then you won an award. They, you yeah, know, they voted you. Tell us about that, the award that you won. So I got Advocate of the Year 2018. Mm -hmm. It's the Black Awards. It was held by Noel Williams, yeah. uh, hosted by Lord Hastings. Lord Hastings. They sort of mentioned, they invited me to the event. So, and it was the last award of the evening. So I didn't know and then Lord Hastings got up and he did this big speech about me. It, it was a it was moving. I didn't think I was getting an award. I was getting a mention. I actually got Advocate of the Year. And it's because all the men in the prison voted for me. And like they were like, I stood up for them when they were right. But I also told them when they were wrong. Yeah. So when they did something wrong, I was, I was the first one to go in and say, listen, you're out of order. You shouldn't be doing that. But when I could generally see they were right, I would take it to the highest level. 
and say the way you're treating them is not fair. Where did that come from, do you think, your passion for the men and just fairness for them and giving them a chance, giving them an opportunity? Because these were men for whom a lot of people just thrown away the key and just said, you know what, they're in for 25 years, just... I could have been there myself. Interesting, yeah. I was no good at school. I was a class idiot because I didn't understand basic English math. Couldn't read my two, I was gone seven, so I was so far behind everyone else. I got shot from school to school to school, never really sell because my mum moved about all the time. And I thought the only way to fit in is to be that class idiot because I didn't understand it. So I used to play up all the time, true in the sea. I would go out stealing, taking drugs, all at the age of 13, 14. Like, no one could tell me what to do. At the age of 14, I then got moved from my mum to my dad's. My mum's like, I can't handle you no more, you're going to your dad. My dad was a prison officer, like high up prison officer. He was strict regime. I'm like, I'm not listening to your regime. And fair play to my dad, the stepmom, they persevered. My stepmom, first of all, said, I don't want you. He's a troublemaker. He's going to like have bad influence on my two kids. My dad was like, he's my son. Let's give him a chance. And I did let him down. And I apologised to him. I, I, me and my friends, we went to Oxford. We had money, but... I thought, no, I can just go shoplifting instead. Why do I need to spend more money? Got caught. My dad got called out of prison. So you imagine at the time a principal officer being called up, your son's in custody. And this, I was like, oh, embarrassing. But my granddad played the biggest key part in my life. He was always there for me and he always said, you're good. He said, they're good in you, you're just doing bad. He said, do you have a choice? And I was like, I thought, what does it mean I've got a choice? He said, you go down that path or you take that path or you're going to end up in prison. I remember he, was, he got diagnosed with cancer and he didn't have long to live. And I was going through all my, um, I got in as an OSG, which is an abortion operation sport crate. And I failed the test three times because obviously my reading and writing wasn't good. And I never studied, but I thought I'm going to study, study, study. So I studied really hard and I passed. And they weren't supposed to tell you you passed. My friend was on the board and he told me, he said, oh, Richard, I'm going to tell you, like, you have passed. So I went and told my granddad, so excited. I got a granddad, like, I passed and all that. And then that night he died. He was a bit off, right? Yeah, he died. And then from then I just took it on. I thought, actually, he's always told me I was good. So I thought, let's tell men they're good. So maybe that will change. Won't change all of them. Don't get me wrong, I'm not stupid. There's some that just don't want to change. But it was my granddad that changed me and always believed in me. So. Yeah, and I love that. And I love that. That I love the. You got given opportunity that you then. <laughs> I, love the, I love the fact that you then got you then got given opportunity, which you which then played out for for these men, and some of these men will be affected for the rest of their life because of the opportunity that you gave them. And so I'm I'm very keen to understand where people have been given opportunity. I'm a massive believer that it's all about someone taking a chance. My story is the same. Someone took a bet on me at one point and just said, you know, well, maybe no one else believes in you, but I'm going to take one chance on you. Now you have to take that chance when someone bets on you, but. But when you do that, amazing how you can completely, you can change the game for someone. Mm -hmm. Well, I hear that, Rich, in your stories, I suppose the, an empathetic side because you can relate to it. Yeah, so they that side of the, that, <clears throat> that situation. So the kids now I work, obviously I do the youth intervention on the Isle of Man, and I can see them, like, they're the, they have to act up in school because they think it's the cool thing to do. They're, they're smoking drugs, they're taking cars, they're, they're getting into Mr. Meat Shop, they're not, they're not hardcore criminals. If I put them in swell, so they wouldn't last five minutes with the guys there. So I tell them the stories about them, but I've also been in their shoes. Yeah. So when I try to reach out to them, and I know they don't listen straight away, and it takes a lot of time to build that trust with them, that bond. And like the big, biggest thing I struggle at the moment I'm on is lack of funding to do things with the kids. So, like I was speaking to you earlier, if I can try and find some funding to do things, I can put them on Duke Edinburgh Awards. I've started to work with schools now because they don't attend school. They've got no interest in school. So how do you shape their mindset to something different? Is we have to try something different. I get one hour a week with them. Can I shape someone in an hour? With the men in prison, I was with them 24 seven, really. And to the point where I'd work on one wing, and then I'll get a phone call from a wing saying, no, Richard, can you come and see this person? So I give up my lunch break just to go and see him because you have to build that trust. Yeah. And I'd do a night shift and then I'd stay on so Lord Hastings can visit. So I've been up all night and then I'd work all day 
And then I come back and do the night shift. But it shows the men that actually, I believe in this program. I believe that there's a future for you. And then they start believing in themselves. And you believe in yourself, that's powerful. I've got to say, I do think, I do think you're one of the most underutilized resources out there. I've got to say, in terms of your passion, your commitment, your understanding of people and particularly your people in the justice system. Well, I've never met anyone like you. And so the fact that you're not being used to the max to do that in whatever system you find yourself to me is like, yeah, that is just, yeah, yeah that's crazy. I totally agree. And, and we've had a conversation before where you quite passionate, you talk quite passionately about the prison system itself. Would you, would you like to talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, I've always been fascinated with prison. I don't know what it was from a young age. It's just, I don't know, it's maybe because my dad was in the prison, like my granddad was in the Air Force, and I was always fascinated with it. Like, I loved watching documentary on Alcatraz, and not like to be a bad boy because I couldn't, I couldn't live that lifestyle. Like, I've got friends that have lived that lifestyle, and the one thing they always say to me is what I try and teach the kids now is they always live in fear when that door's knocked. Is, is it the police? Who's coming to get me? And they can never be. They're on edge 24-7. And when they get caught, that stress goes from them. So I'm caught now. I don't have to live on edge. And it's amazing. So when I speak to the kids about it, I said, I bet you when you've committed an offence, you're all sat at home, wait for the door to knock. And they said, yeah. And I said, I bet when that door knocks and the police take you, you go, oh, it's a relief. And it, it must be. Like, I don't remember this kid doing stuff and then you think, I've been caught now. I, don't, I haven't got to hide it. So with prisons, I'm always fascinated. But I didn't know how... I would manage as an officer. So I didn't know how could I adapt. And I remember my first year, and a guy came up to me and he said, Richard, what kind of officer do you want to be? And I was like, what do you mean? I said, he said, I've been in a long time. And I said, you, I said, do you have two choices? You can be an officer that like always cuts corners, lies to us. And he said, and we'll never respect you. Or just tell us the truth from day one. I said, what do you mean by that? I said, if the answer is no, just tell us no. Right? He said, we'll respect that more. We might not like it, but we respect it more. So I always took that. So if the answer was no, and I knew they weren't going to like it, and they knew they were going to be a tantrum, I would still tell them no. Be like, the answer is no. If you can go to someone higher than me, a governor, and he approves it, I'll get it for you. But right now, the answer, because you have to follow up rules and boundaries. And yes, there's certain rules I, I would break, but it wasn't the crime of the century. I wasn't going to get anyone in trouble. I wasn't taking drugs or phones in. But like allowing someone five minutes extra in the shower or getting permission to bring him a birthday cake because he's just lost his mum. Little human touches like that. Oh, exactly. That's the point, I think, is I think yeah, you really bring the human touch. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with that. Is more every time I see to be honest with you, because people couldn't quite work out why would I drive two hours to Swellside for three weeks in a row. Enough to come and yeah, well, yeah. Come and do that. And it was really because I believed in what you were doing in the prison. Like you really, along with Lord Hastings, who was also in there doing some some incredibly um, cool work, really meaningful work, and Kenny and you know Quentin and the rest of them. But you were, if you like, the conductor of the orchestra. I feel like you were in the prison pulling us in. Like without you, I think we would have struggled to get in there and to just because the prison system itself actually didn't totally kind of get what we were trying to do, and was, it was a bit sort of side of desk and wasn't part of the main there's prisons run they're very systematized it's an it, basically everything happens in a certain way which it has to it's a prison you're running right so every door has to be locked a certain way everyone's got exactly the right keys everything's done according to schedule this is the hierarchy like you don't have extra stuff going on there are very clear rules and regulations and in the middle of all that kind of regulation you've got <laughs> you've got richard Doing cool stuff, basically, yeah. Just, well, disrupting it, but, but disrupting it for good, yeah. I had to use, so I had to be clever about it. So I had to use it during Black History Month. Unfortunately, like, where I worked, it wasn't just for black people. So everyone goes, oh, you just work with black people. It wasn't. It was for anyone. It's just the majority of people in the side, 70% were black prisoners. So I used it under the banner of Black History Month. So I thought I could do all these events because I was working in safer custody, and it was just that window of opportunity I had, and I took it, open arms. Because, let's be honest, I didn't know Lord Hastings. It was a guy that served me 30 years that knew him, who gave me the contact. I didn't know Gwenton, 
It was a guy serving 30 years. He gave me his contact. I took the opportunity and said, I will ring him up and see. And I remember when I met the queer and I went, I had to go to central London. I don't like going to London anyway, because I don't like how busy it is and like, but then my ex-wife turned around and said, um, what are you going to do if they kidnap you? And I was like, what? She goes, well, they're gangsters and like they could be, this could be a ploy to get you and then they're going to put a ransom. I said, well, they ain't going to get much out of me. It's a lot of things <laughs> like that. But that was her mentality. It's like, actually, they're all in there because they've committed a serious crime. And I met this lady and she was lovely. She was like, literally just like, right, I'll bring this person in. She brought Twinbee in. She brought Retch Free 2 in. She bought Janet Quayle, the Olympian. She bought Femin, and he was a um, comedian. And honestly, every single event had no incidents. At the time, Swell Side was having incidents all the time. I didn't have one late lockup. I didn't have no incidents. I didn't have no back chat or anything. And so I thought, right, what's next? Then obviously, I went and wrote a good friend of mine now, like, he came and did the mediation program, but he was coming up and doing talks for me. He's done a book from the streets to Scotland Yard, how he changed his life from being a top gangster to actually it's not worth it. And then obviously Lord Henson's come in, Dow would come in, and it just got bigger then. Like you talk about travelling, Michael Maisie is a really nice guy as well, and you know, he went to prison, he wrote a book called Young Fender. I contacted him all through Messenger. So everyone I contact through Messenger, and I'll send him a long message, and I'll be like, I haven't got a budget. I'm honest from day one. Will you come in? And he said, yeah. And he come all the way from Devon in a storm to deliver a program. And now he goes into prisons as well, and he gets paid for it. But it's just like the men trust me to have their, like, I only think of their, what, what's good for them. So I'm not going to bring someone in who's going to try and disrupt the system or try and bring drugs in. Everyone I go, I vet very carefully. Uh, I think what's quite interesting is once you get into, when you go into a prison, particularly a Cat B prison like Swellside, these men are extremely attuned to figuring out, like, have you got some ulterior motive? Why are you in here? Why are you doing this? What are you, what's your, what's your game? Well, and, it's sufficient, isn't it? Yeah, well, unless you are completely authentic, mm. They're not interested. They're not going. To, they're just not going to. They're not going to get it. And I think with Richard, they got that he was completely authentic. Was completely on their side. Was never going to sell them out. Was completely dialed into helping them to make the most of their. Let's face it, pretty catastrophic situation. I mean, a lot of these men. I remember you explaining to me have something called daymares. So a daymare, which is outside the prison, you're not heard of, but it's like a nightmare. But you have it during the day, where you just see the faces of people that you've had some violent interaction with. Whatever in whatever that might have been, you just see that every day, all day. Like it never leaves your never leaves your consciousness, and you're in a little cell, and you're being followed around by this person, face, and and you know, unsurprisingly, your mental health is shot. Your propensity to try to take mind altering subjects, to, uh, substances to help is you know is is heightened. Your suicidal tendencies are high. You're locked up the whole time. You can't get out. I mean, what are you going to do, right? So in the middle of all that, you've got someone who's got your best. Uh, uh, your your your, your you know, best intentions for you, yeah. You're gonna you're gonna you're gonna fully lean into that person, which is what Richard was. Yeah. It's like prisoners people watch, so they watch everything you do. So a good officer will also people watch. So you watch how they are, and you can tell how a wing is. So if it's so silent and settled, no one's come out, you know something's gonna happen. So you're like, oh, so you're on edge. But also when you watch people as well, you can see what mood they're in. So you can tell them when they come back from visit, how their demeanor is. And I remember one guy come back from a visit and like, in prison you still have to act up, like all your friends are there. Yeah, yeah, it's good, mate. I'm all good. Everything's fine. Like then he'll shut his door and he's there crying. So you go in and you're like, you go, well, no, no, I don't want to come out. Well, I just want to be left alone. And you're like, okay, but I'll come back later. And you go back later and you go, he goes, oh yeah, my little daughter's having nightmares and I can't. And they start thinking like, I put myself in this position and I can't protect my family. And that really eats them up inside. So if you're then turning around saying, no, you can't do this, you can't do that, and all of a sudden they got, they lose all that hope and they, they'll be like, do you know what, I'll show you. But when you talk to them and you just say, listen, I don't know what it's like to be in your shoes, I'm not locked up, like, it must be horrible that your daughter's going through this and she's being picked on and you can't do anything. But actually you can, you can write her a letter, you can phone her, 
it's about getting them to think of other things that they can do to actually support their family instead of like, let's go back to the old way of I'm just going to smash up that guy over there. Yeah. And they literally will smash someone up just for looking at them and go, what are you looking at? And you'll be like, oh my God, do you know what? Just can't you see he's like focus. He just wants to get to his cell. And, and then you've got, there's some really good officers that I would say a hundred times better than I was. Right. But they didn't take the chance to do what I did. So you had some really good staff that had such good rapport and they can get things done. Don't get wrong because they got things done, but they were just knowledgeable about every department because they've been there for years. But there's also some officers that you just think, why are you here? You're just antagonizing them. You're not helping them. You're just, and that's a shame until they can sort that out. It's just, Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, yeah, prisons, it's difficult to work. You have to be a certain character. But you have to want to help people. If you don't, there's no point being there. Right. Just conscious of time, guys. So appreciate your time. Really yeah. And so far, I think probably see it for another couple of hours. Probably. Yeah. People have got to get on. So thanks for your time. It's been a pleasure. It's been great. Thanks for having us on the board. It's a uh, word out from Martin and word out from Carl. Thank you very much. Cheers, guys. No, you're welcome. Poor flimsy humans. Don't you wish you were flawless like me? A towering inferno of physical perfection? I hate to pop your blimp-like ego, but you're not perfect.